everybody, and welcome to our Google Plus Hangout with the Buck Institute for Education. I'm John Larmer, Editor-in-Chief here at BIE, and we'll be talking today with uh, three of our national faculty members. Uh, more than a second, a couple of logistics first. Uh, this is uh, being archived at BIE.org, so if you miss part of the Hangout or want to tell friends and colleagues about it, it will be on our archive at BIE.org. And it lasts for about a half an hour, plus or minus a few minutes. If you want to ask questions, you can post them on the Google Plus events page, and I'll relay them to our guests uh, if they're on point. If not, we might answer them offline later on the Google Plus events page. Uh, but be, please feel free to ask questions, and we might get to some at the end as well. So today we're talking about um, gold standard project-based learning. That's our theme for all of this year's Hangouts. And today, one of the project-based teaching practices uh, design and plan. So let's hear from. Uh, let's hear who our guests are first. So, um, you guys, how about just introducing yourselves? What, you know who you are, where you are, and what you what you do in a, in a couple of sentences. How about An Angela? I'll start with you. Farthest east. Okay, great. I'm Angela Marzilli. I'm from Portland, Maine, and um, along with being on the BIE national faculty, I work in South Portland. Um, as the STEM and the project-based learning coach at our schools, uh, pre-K through 12. Okay. Thanks, Angela. And Brand, uh, Myla, let's go to you, in the middle of the country. Yes, my name is Myla Lee. I am um, in Michigan. I am an instructional coach from in the Novi Community School District. Uh, the past two years, I was a project-based learning specialist, and I work uh, pretty much uh, K-12 in terms of project-based learning, but as an instructional coach, my focus is elementary. Okay. Nice to have you again, Myla. And Brandon from San Diego. My name is Brandon. I am from San Diego. For the past four years, I've been teaching at High Tech High in Point Loma. Now I am an education consultant. Okay. Welcome, Brandon. All right. So, um, Today, as I said, we're talking about gold standard project-based learning, and one of the teaching practices is um, design and plan. So here's our model for the project-based teaching practices, and as you can tell, there are seven practices, and the focus in the middle is on what students are gaining through the project, the key knowledge, understanding, and success skills. Um, so today, we're talking about the first one up on top there, design and plan, and we'll move to other topics in other months of this year. So, um, on the topic of design and plan, then, let me toss out my first question, and um, perhaps I'll start with, um, how about Brandon to start with this question? So, um, how do you begin to design a project? So, you know, what's a typical process uh, for you, or perhaps other teachers you've seen? Uh, where do teachers get ideas? Are there some, you know, various ways to start designing a project? All right, well, it helps to know my audience. My audience are my clients, our 12th grade, uh, 12th grade environmental science uh, students. Being 12th graders, sometimes it's a little hard to grab their attention since uh, they got their foot out the door and they're headed to college, especially second semester. I like to start out with what I'm passionate about. If you remember your best uh, classes, it had nothing to do with the content, it had to do with the teacher being passionate. So I think about what I want to do, and then I also think about what could be an authentic deliverable. Uh, by finding an authentic de deliverable, I reach out to community and find out what's needed. Um, a recent project, the Eco Geocache project, we reached out to the San Diego River Park Foundation, uh, so, some rangers that we know at the Torrey Pine State Reserve, and we said, hey, what do you need? They said, we need interpretive signs. And I brought that to my class and said, all right, let's uh, create interpretive signage. I think you have an image of that. And then... Uh, that happened again with uh, Birds of the San Diego River where we reached out and we said, hey, what do you need, San Diego River Park Foundation? They said we need interpretive signs. Uh, so we created two foot by three foot posters that they could use along with uh, QR, link, QR code links to videos that my students produced. I think we have an image of that as well. Um, and then, of course, like I said, I like to think about what's going to get me excited. Those past two projects were projects that got the students excited by getting them out of the classroom with, with lots of field trips and a lot of field work. Then this uh, other large project I did, uh, the tiny house project, I thought about what I like to do. I like to build stuff, and I always wanted to build a house. So I said, hey, let's build a tiny house. And with the students, the students created informational placards. 
we actually built the house, and I think we have some images of that all the way from design to the different parts of the construction phase. The students having such an authentic deliverable that showed small living and sustainable living uh, they had a lot of buy-in to that project, and it was something hands-on that they had never done before. Brandon, could you explain what a tiny house is? A tiny house is a small living space yeah. uh, focused on sustainable living. So our tiny house was, or is, 100 square feet with a sleeping loft. It has solar panels for energy, as well as a gray water recycling system. Uh, it incorporates green materials and also the design we used optimize cross ventilation and things like that to to make it even more sustainable as a as a house as a small carbon footprint and it's just a different way of living so where are these houses placed and who lives in them well there's a big movement up where you are in northern california uh, where you have people who might find a piece of land and put their tiny house there you might have a community of people who have a larger piece of land and they bring their houses there to live there's college students who say, hey, I don't want to live in the dorms or I don't want to put, put out a bunch of money towards uh, rent while I'm in college. I'm going to build a tiny house and live in that. So the, you get the wide range of people who find a tiny house as a suitable living space. Okay. All right, thanks. And uh, Angela, how about you about uh, getting ideas for projects or how you begin to design projects? Um, yeah, my the teachers where I'm the um, PBL coach, I, I think they sometimes, when they see me coming, they think, oh, what's she going to say now? Because um, I don't teach in a classroom anymore, so a lot of the times I'll bring something I saw to teachers and we'll sort of collaboratively work together. Um, but I get a lot of ideas from just what's around. I was in Boston last spring and uh, one of the architectural colleges there had this fascinating bento box exhibit and I thought this is an amazing project waiting to happen um, in geometry and so I went to some middle school teachers um, and I said can we design this you know project will it fit with your standards and part of what's great about my job is that I work pre-k through 12 so I um, just like Brandon talked about knowing what the community needs, I kind of can know what our school community needs in places, and I knew that um, the kindergarten class needed, um, was doing breakfast every morning and needed something to, you know, pack their breakfast in. So we, so we can work with the sixth grade teachers to design these boxes for the kindergarten breakfasts. Um, so I just get a lot of ideas from what's around, and then I rely on teachers to, to help me um, flesh out the ideas and, and do the actual teaching. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. And Milo, where do teachers get ideas in your experience? Or some well, of the various ways to start. Well, along with what Brandon and Angela were saying, you know, reaching out to your community is a huge part of it. Um, knowing what, what, in terms of going past the walls of your classroom, past the walls of your district, to say, you know, going to the Chamber of Commerce, reaching out to them, also using social media to find ways, like um, several of my teachers have used uh, Twitter to find other ideas out there, um, and use things such as Facebook to pull their ideas from. Um, Part of that is also looking at the headlines. A lot of the teachers, especially in the elementary setting, is to look at um to look at the like the headlines that they would find in uh, children's magazines like the informational like Time and Scholastic and some other like made for kids because those are the headlines that are pertinent to kids lives and so to do an offshoot off of that but the other piece is also to build those relationships with students um, to get to know what the students are interested in uh, that's a big part of creating that culture piece is knowing what your students are passionate about as well because what they're passionate about is what will become your passion you know as you go through and and create these lessons and and the units um, a couple of just recently uh, I had a fifth grade team they did the whole thing on uh, should we recognize Columbus Day and they got really riveted about that and they pulled information and um, did a, a like a picture essay and they tweeted it out. Um, I had other teachers uh, you know um, who created a Asian fusion project because they realized that in our community we have such a diverse community how can we unify that community in terms of the, um, the different cultures and so they did it through art um, and we just I just last week there was this math project that they did um, 
conical, they created a um, conical design of using conical shapes for a park. What was really interesting about that is I, during presentation day as I was interviewing the marching band group, they were saying this is really important to us because that's where we always march, in the park. So they had relevance to that. It was meaningful to them. And so a lot of the ideas come from like places that you would find like in BIE websites and all that in terms of getting ideas. But you really need to start with the student and, and also know exactly what they're passionate about. Okay, so I'm hearing that uh, 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 authenticity of the world and to students do their own line. Um, interesting, none of you said start with the standards, because oftentimes you hear that, that people should start with the standards and then get ideas from that. We'll talk a lot more about aligning the standards in a future thing, but, but I was curious, did you notice teachers that you worked with, um, or did you yourself ever start with the standards themselves? Or did you just think of the idea first in the way you guys were just describing and then map that back onto the standards? Um, in my district, we have a curriculum guide. So there, the standards are an important part of that. But um, I know this is going to be addressed later, but part of it is also making sure that it doesn't become, that become, yeah, the standards are really important and we need to embrace that. But if you're trying to, um, and the teachers that I'm working with, they will look at the standards and they will probably pull their ideas and try to connect it and authentically with other experts. Um, because we, are, we have common assessments and other pieces in place that they need to align with the standards, that becomes a part of it, but it shouldn't be all of it. Mm -hmm. um, again, it, it's like it's a starting point, but where can we do it so the kids get excited about the learning? I would like to piggyback on that. I, I think it, it's really important as a starting point, like Myla said, uh, but there's also other considerations. It's almost something that you cycle back to. You as a teacher know that you know your general curriculum. And so you kind of have that in the back of your mind. Oh, I want to do a project about environmental science. And then you start focusing on like what Myla said and Angela said, what interests the students, what's going to be authentic. And once you have that general idea of the project, then you cycle back to the standards and say, okay, now how am I really going to hit these standards? So okay. it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think when you're planning, um, you have to also keep in mind time, which uh, Myla talked about common assessments, and in my district we have um, windows of common assessments. So not only do you have common assessments, but they need to be done in a certain time frame. And so there's a, you know, you can't take a little tiny standard and spend months and months on it. So you have to kind of think about, you know, am I spending an appropriate amount of time for the standards that I'm covering? Okay. Okay. Uh, great point about you need to, to keep, keep a watch on your school and your school calendar. Um, Next question is the general topic of collaborative design of projects. It's not just always a teacher by themselves, right? So with other mm -hmm. teachers or outside experts or with students. So how about the idea of collaborative planning? Um, oh, why don't I start with my own this time? Um, it's interesting because um, as I've been working with my cohort of teachers, it's kind of exciting that now they they can't wait to get together to do critical friends. Because um, that's where they um, they get their critique and revision in terms of getting feedback. The protocol of critical friends, where um, they're getting feedback about likes and wonders and and uh, resources that are available for them um, from their colleagues. That's pretty powerful for them. Um, the other piece is that I try the teachers. We try to build in um, whether it be in a Google Doc or some other form or a Google Hangout where teachers can talk to each other and brainstorm ideas. Uh, what was really impressive is when we have secondary and elementary or middle school together and they realize that they have a lot of uh, resources within each other's content that they can pull from. Um, like Angela was saying in her school, finding what, what the resources we have within our own school community. Um, the powerful part, I think, for but what's made our projects better in our district is the fact that the teachers are open 
to um, to getting feedback, and, it, and it's not something that happens right away. You know, it's creating that culture and um, protocols such as critical friends and getting some feedback and and giving them a time and space to do that is really important. Um, the other piece that is pretty powerful, and as they're planning, is um, you know, when they're sitting down there, they finally add this aha, like what would a scientist, what kind of problems would a scientist have? And one of the teachers said, well, why don't you ask a scientist? <laughs> and so, you know, that's what the fact that they're reaching out, you know, to not only the authentic audience in the presentation, but going to the expert to say, what kind of problems or challenges do you face? What would you want our kids to address? And starting that conversation, the whole thing is you won't know unless you ask. And so that's part of it. Our, the teachers that I'm working with, they're becoming more open to going outside and, and pulling that relevancy from the outside world and realizing that part can be part of, is a critical piece in planning and designing. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, we have a partnership with a Texas Instruments plant near our school. And just, I mean, when you want projects to be really authentic, you don't always know the authentic connections. Right. And so we're but still we're building this um, partnership. But we have engineers and technicians who work with teachers um, to help them come up with ideas and to plan really authentic projects. Okay. Brandon, you got some thoughts on the question? Both the ladies uh, said it really well. The only thing I'd add is that collaboration can be encouraged by administration by creating cohorts of students that teachers share. The projects at my school are so fruitful and so robust because we have cross-curricular projects where I might be teamed up with a media arts teacher or an English teacher or an art teacher, and with them we really get to dive in and make a, a rigorous, robust project. And just by having that collaboration, that day-to-day -day collaboration, by having shared prep periods, by having specific times for prep in the morning, we're able to, to do things like critical friends or gallery walks uh, because we can plan for those. We can plan to bring things to the whole staff and the administration supports that. I'd like to add on, though, um, because uh, I presented that one time to one of the schools, and the leadership in our in our um, district said, "Well, we have to think creatively because of just how the setup was in our in that particular building. So you can be creative with creating that time and space by making you know like it was interesting. Um, one lunch period, um, he he asked the, his teachers, "Could you?" Um, would you mind giving some feedback because it's very important to this grade level? So they used some of their lunch period or and they sat and they listened to this project. I think part of it is also in terms of leadership, if you don't have that structure where you could have that cross curriculum piece, is to be creative to give some of that time and to think, okay, maybe instead of having a staff meeting, 20 minutes of giving a gallery walk, you know, offering for a project to be proposed. I, because it adds to that the culture of the building as well, and and you know what a gift you had, Brandon, to be able to have it like right then and there. Mm -hmm. But I know in sometimes buildings that don't have that gift, it's just to be creative with their time, and trying to utilize um, PLC time or staff meeting times, or you know sometimes their prep time or lunch time. You know if teachers are given that time, or or they can think creatively how they can gain that time. Um, then that's that's something that helps teachers collaborate. And no matter where you're teaching, all it takes is one episode of Critical Friends to be sold on Critical Friends, right? Absolutely. And and the thing is, if they start doing Critical Friends, they're reminded that's the kind of culture they want their students to have. Right. Have any of you uh, had experience with, with students sort of co-designing a project with teachers? That's, that's kind of an advanced practice. We often recommend that teachers beginning PBL do most of the designing on their, you know, uh, of the project themselves. But more advanced practice might be to include students in the process. So anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, when you get into a PBL environment and you have teachers always creating projects, the teachers can 
create a project a semester before they're going to launch it and get feedback from students a semester early. So it definitely involves students. Um, I've seen a teacher do this really well, actually, with um, not a classroom of students, but one student um, who found a grant, who had an idea, and she said, you know, I think that's a really great idea. Why don't you go out and find some funding for it? And even though it was just this one student doing this project, it was still, um, you know, it had all the elements of project-based learning, and he went out and found his funding and wrote his grant, and um, and it was a really great project, and I'm sure it would be replicable with more students, but just the idea, even if you had a whole class that, that said, you know, we want to do this, to turn it back on them and say, okay, you know, I... I'm with you on that, I can help you do this, you know, these are the steps we need, or, or if you can go out and find funding, I will help you get it done. Um, I thought that was just a great example of, of how she was sort of flexible and went with that student. And it would take a lot of comfort, like I think John had said, you know, um, kids who were um, familiar with project-based learning in the future who, who was comfortable giving up that kind of control, but I know it was a really valuable experience for both of them. Um, that whole thing of co-creating a project, there's a, two examples. One is I had a first grade teacher, two first grade teachers who um, co-created um, their um, challenge question, driving question, with these little first graders. And think about, and by the, it was really interesting because these students were, this, these little six-year-olds were able to distinguish between um, a driving question or a, a challenging question to help them with this uh, with their project and um, that was part that was one way they helped co-create it because it from that point it it created the project itself the other piece is when I was in the classroom uh, I was in the classroom just like three years ago and I was fortunate enough to um, to loop with my students so I had them for two years and by the second year, um, because I was doing PBL back-to-back uh, -back and realized, um, so I ended up with a committee of students who ended up uh, working with me. And they, they each brought, brought out a lot of their uh, gifts and strengths for this project. And so we worked together. They gave up some, some of their lunch time and, and their recess time to help uh, plan out this project that would be um, that we would do in the classroom and talk about pressure, I mean their peer pressure, the audience, because it wasn't just anyone else, it was their peers who were going to experience this project. And then at the end we actually reflected, um, it was on, it was on um, tech, technology integration in a 21st century classroom with literacy. And so these students had to beef up on literacy strategies as well as technology integration and their audience was not only their classmates, but their audience was the world at large, you know. And so that was a big impact for them. But it was kind of, it was so, I think it was the best learning for me as a teacher to watch the students co-create it with me, their thinking processes. It was the best professional learning I had because um, no one could teach me what those kids taught me. Wow. Good story, Michael. Thanks. All right, we better move on to our next question. Time's going fast here. Um, about the idea of planning. So we talked about designing projects, but how about the actual sort of nuts and bolts planning process? How much do you get in advance, for example? How much do the teachers consider when planning? And how much do you like when you kind of advance them on the fly during the process? Oh, how about we start with this time? Um, I think my first project, I overplanned. I I actually outrageously overplanned. Um, uh, not only just sort of overestimating how much we could get done in a chunk of time, but just underestimating how much work time and processing time and thinking time students really needed. And so my sort of one big thing when I plan projects is to really make sure and give kids plenty of work time. Because if you've set up checkpoints and you've created their need to know and they care about the project, they're invested in it, they'll use it. I think um, sometimes as teachers we're afraid to give kids a lot of work time because we think, oh, they're going to just move around. If you 
give them a whole period of work time. They won't spend the whole period working. Mm -hmm. um, but if, you, if you've created that real drive and they care about what's happening, they'll use the work time and they need it. They need it to process what they're doing and, and do it thoughtfully. Uh, Brandon? I think the best way to plan for a project is to do it yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd say 95% of the projects that teachers do, they could, in fact, do themselves. They can see the bottlenecks. And then figure out what the multiplier is for your students. For my students, the multiplier is three or four. If something takes me an hour, it takes them three or four hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a bigger picture, the amount of planning I do has to do with defining the final deliverable and all the intermediate deliverables that are going to lead up to that final deliverable. So if I know what everyone needs to accomplish every week or two weeks, the day-to-day -day kind of sorts itself out. Yeah, I would agree with Brandon. Um, have the end in mind and know the deliverables in between the checkpoints um, because so many... And, and also keep the driving question or the question the challenge, not only for the students but for you as the teacher because you might have this wow, I, I have this other great idea, you know, but does it meet, does it answer that question or the challenge? You know, um, that's what I always hold to teachers when they're ready to say, oh, but I have this other idea, because you're going to have lots of ideas in the process, and it might get you off track, and you might have a year-long forever project, and I always say to teachers, it has to end. At some point, mm -hmm. it has to end. So you know, keeping the end in mind so you can, especially for districts that have common assessments, so you can meet, you can definitely address those windows that you have to, um, the expectations your district has for you. And one more thing, it's okay to plan like crazy, but just be flexible to change your plan because no project's going to go the, the way you think it's going to. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I was just going to ask about the, as you mentioned, because yeah, a lot of teachers, at first, especially like Angela said, tend to overplan. Then if, if just keep to a rigid schedule no matter what's happening, and then you wind up with low quality project uh, products or frustrated students. It's a real rush, or maybe you have too much time and you need to shorten the project, which is rare. I hear. All right, well, we better wrap up soon. Let's wrap up with the idea of. of common challenges teachers face when designing and planning projects and how you might coach them to overcome those challenges. Um, and this can be your sort of final word to our, our viewers also, guys. So um, how about let's start with Myla this time. So the common challenges, is that the question? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, the common challenges, I think, let me see, I, I wrote down that um, to be open, that sometimes we get so close, I, I guess that was addressed before, like what Brandon said, you get so caught up in the planning part that you forget to have a little fun too in this learning process, you know, because, um, and take time to reflect. Because sometimes you get this wonderful plan and you're trudging through it to get through the project. And you need time to reflect and say, hey, are the kids having fun? Are the kids engaged? Am I having fun? Am I engaged? you know, because it's a learning community. And so the common challenge, I think, would be is that you feel like you have all this stuff to do. Take time to reflect as you go through it. Have fun. I like that one, Myla. Uh, uh, Brandon, how about you? To piggyback on that, I would say every single project I've ever done has probably two heart-to-heart -heart conversations with the class where it's just kind of refocusing or figuring out, hey, we kind of seem to be off track or not engaged, what's happening? Uh, so having those reflection times for yourself and the classroom and not being scared to have the conversation with the class. Now coming back to the challenges of planning and designing a project, I think a lot of uh, novices in PBL tend to be too tentative. And I just always like to say, you know, Nike said it best, just do it. Just plan your project. Do it. Even try to go big if you want to go big. <coughs> All right. Thanks, Brandon. Go do it. I like that. And Angela? Well, that's really funny hearing your um, what you two have said because my sort of thought was um, teachers kind of not being great and not sort of thinking, you know, I have this great idea. I think my kids will love it. 
I'm not, I've planned it as much as I can, but I'm still not 100% sure how it's going to work, but I'm going to try it. Um, because if you're excited and your kids are excited, they'll be right there with you. Um, so being brave enough to try it and then being brave enough to be flexible throughout it. So if you're like, ooh, this isn't exactly going how I had envisioned, but I can change it a little bit and it'll still be great. I think it's, um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. I think part of it is that we expect our students to be risk takers and flexible and lifelong learners and we have to do that too. Yeah, and I think uh, another aspect of being brave, Brandon, you mentioned this earlier, um, even for a teacher to get on the phone and call, uh, call a local expert, call somebody in the business community, a scientist, a professor, somebody at a corporation, well, that takes some guts too. Yes, yeah, students can make those kind of connections. For teachers too, it helps, as you said, a local experts might take a little bit of a leap of faith and some courage to pick up that phone or send that email. Definitely. All right. Okay, guys, well, thanks a lot. I uh, appreciate your being here with us. And um, to our viewers, as, as I said, you can watch this on the BIE.org archive and tell a friend about it and pass a word to colleagues. In uh, two weeks, on Tuesday, October 27th, will be our next Hangout, and also on Gold Standard PBL, on the topic of challenging problem or question, which is one of our potential project mind elements. We'll talk about framing your projects with a challenging problem or question, often written in the mobile driving, as we, we promote. And we have a couple of guests from our national faculty who are STEM uh, experts. And also a, a special guest, Brandon, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, uh, the Enable uh, organization. Uh, it's got John Schull, the professor at Rochester Institute of Technology. And they make uh, prosthetic hands, other things with, with 3D printers. And now it's a worldwide network of schools that are doing these kind of uh, high-tech projects. And um, it'll be a very great hangout there with John and two of our national faculty. So, wow. hope to see you again in two weeks. And um, thanks to our guest today, and thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.